Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this new edition of uh, Startup and Angels. My name is Leo Dones, and I'll be your MC today uh, for this fantastic edition uh, and maybe one of our last online or pure online event for this year. Um, so today, uh, this event is part of uh, the Spark Festival. We actually, uh, that's actually the last day. So I, I hope you really made the most of all the opportunities to get your uh, startup fix. Uh, and today is really one of the highlights, I suppose, of the, of the festival we've been part of and supporting since inception in uh, 2016. Uh, today, uh, so great job to Maxine and her team. Uh, and, uh, and a big thanks to the New South Wales government uh, for supporting Spark Festival. So today we've got a pretty packed agenda uh, with a number of highlights. Uh, after this uh, quick uh, welcome and intro words, we'll jump into a pitching contest with uh, early stage fintech startups from all over Australia. We actually have representative from uh, Brisbane with, uh, with Lisa, Shivani from Sydney, uh, David from Adelaide and Tim from Melbourne. Uh, we'll, the, the pitch contest will be uh, actually facilitated by my co-founder, Axel, uh, and assisted with uh, three very experienced judges in this occasion, uh, Rob, Yanling, Evan, um, from uh, you know, various backgrounds, from investment and technical background. Uh, then we'll jump into, so you'll get a chance actually uh, as an attendee to vote for your favorite startup. Uh, and uh, I'll announce the, the various prize we've got for this uh, contest, just as part of this intro. Uh, at around 5 p.m. Sydney time, we'll have a fireside chat moderated by David Kenny, a start mate mentor and investor and partner at Old Shadwick, uh, with uh, Ray Ross, the co-founder of Button, uh, who is now an A6 listed company. Okay, then we'll have a, a quick wrap up. Uh, please, please, I encourage you all to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, as well as use the uh, Q&A function. Uh, and you should now see a, a quick poll so we understand you know, what's the audience today. Uh, if your background is in FinTech, if you are a startup founder, uh, you know, where you're from, uh, so we get a chance to know who is who and how we can uh, assist you today. So quick word about Startup and Angel. You know, we've seen a, a number of members uh, attending today. So that's fantastic. Um, so basically we created uh, this journey over five years ago now. We traveled 15 countries with, with Axel, uh, mainly in Asia Pacific, but as well in Africa. Uh, and our next stop is to Europe. Now the borders have, have reopened. Uh, and um, we've now launched an online uh, community that you can join. Uh, you know, you'll have a various call to action to join the community if you're not part of it. You can create a startup profile. You can share with us your wins and your needs, uh, and we'll do the best to, you know, help you grow your business. A uh, few words about Australians, the company behind Startup and Angel. Basically, we're assisting, uh, you know, a number of startups uh, as well un as unicorns and technology companies to, uh, to grow to new markets with Australians access to grow their team, build a rockstar team with Australian talent, uh, you know, and with various initiatives, uh, grow their network, you know, find new clients, especially, you know, if you're B2B uh, oriented and targeting SME to enterprise, you know, we, we've got a, a broad international and local network in Australia. Um, we're also part of the Pledge One Person movement and strong supporter. Uh, and, you know, make, make, we really want to make sure, you know, we, we have an impact each day. Uh, and uh, so that's our concept through Australian talent. Uh, and we know looking to, uh, you know, assist um, a number of early stage HR tech startups uh, we, with a mix of, you know, advice, uh, you know, cash um, this year. We're just starting this initiative. So now the top prize today for the um, pitch contest is uh, a one year membership to the OVH Cloud Startup Program. OVH Cloud is a platinum partner with Startup and Angel. Uh, you know, some of the highlights of this program is actually give you, uh, you know, a check or credit of up to 15 grand, uh, you know, to uh, use on OVH Cloud products, such as public cloud, machine learning, AI training, 
You also receive technical support from solution architects, subject matter experts. Uh, OVH Cloud is no unicorn. Actually, uh, IPO'd uh, just last week um, in, in France uh, and has a huge network, uh, you know, both in Asia, Pacific, Europe, and internationally. So uh, great prize. Big thanks to OVH Cloud for their support. Uh, the runner-up uh, will uh, also get a prize from uh, our own company, Australians, um, $2,000 credits on various solutions. Uh, you know, so hopefully it's going to be a, a great kickstart for, for your business and a good push for, uh, you know, to, to grow and, and, and be successful in 2022. Now, when you will be voting for your favorite startup, the, the favorite startup today, your favorite startup, uh, will actually be featured on our podcast, Startup and Angel. Uh, you know, 20 minute interview, uh, you know, to share, you know, your vision, uh, your journey and, you know, uh, the success or the impact you're looking to have, uh, you know, in the coming months or years. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned, um, vote for your preferred uh, pitch today uh, so we can all listen and replay and know more about the founder behind the, behind the pitch. So, you know, Startup and Angel, wouldn't be possible without you know, our various partners and very active members. So big, big thanks to you know, OVH Cloud, Aircall, Fondsquire, Old Shadwick, Salesforce App Exchange, Pledge One Percent, you know, and all of you uh, today, uh, you know, speakers, judges, you know, giving giving some of your precious precious time, uh, advice, um, and you know, uh, very very proud to uh, you know to uh, have founded and you know. Uh, this amazing community, very vibrant community, um, and you know, hope we can uh, you know get more members, assist you, um, and have a real impact on your on your business and your entrepreneurial journey. So I, I'll now hand over to uh, Axel, my co-founder, to uh, introduce our judging panel for the day. Thanks, Leo. Uh, good to uh, meet you all uh, today. Really happy to have uh, this uh, virtual event uh, again all together on this uh, FinTech uh, series. Um, I'll uh, let the uh, judges introduce themselves and we start with uh, Youngling from uh, OVH Cloud. Hi, Youngling, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. I'm Yanling Tan from OVH Cloud Asia Pacific Startup Program Team I'm based in Melbourne. Um, nice meeting you all and good luck for all the uh, pictures later today. So um, just to give you an idea of what this OVH Cloud Startup Program is, um, we are actually supporting startup and scale up in the community by giving uh, infrastructure credit, support, and also exposure branding for the members to reach out to the ecosystem. So since 2015, OVH Club has been supporting uh, more than uh, 2,000 innovative businesses worldwide. So um, nice meeting you guys. Um, we offer reliable and infrastructures uh, and also affordable cloud uh, servers to our startup and scale-up member. Thank you. So uh, Yanling will be uh, judging uh, today with her uh, expertise and background from uh, the uh, infrastructure space. Uh, hi, Robert. Uh, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me along today. Rob Nichols, also, also based up in Sydney. Um, I'm one of the founders of Cradle Ventures. Uh, Cradle Ventures is a private investment company. Our investment focus is technology-led, highly scalable, globally relevant, uh, brazen TAMs, as we tend to refer to them. Our investment stages precede through to Series A. Uh, we form part of the, what we term as the Capital Stack Foundation. Uh, we're agnostic in our, in our sector focus um, with the view that diversity supports diversification, which is always important. Uh, we invest through a range of instruments, safe convertible notes, preference shares, um, so we're open to, to, to the real mix, four to seven year timeframes. Uh, we invested about 13 companies to date. Uh, I've got a, star, a couple of star performance out of there, uh, including Zalian and Mr. Yum. Mr. Yum made a big announcement today, which has been really positive for the portfolio as well. Uh, but also I've been a co-founder, I'm three times co-founder. Uh, I'm also on a, a non-executive director for a couple of those, uh, mentoring, advising, um, helping with uh, the governance structures for startup, which is really important as well. We're really happy to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, you know, provide a bit of feedback to these wonderful entrepreneurs and, and get the ecosystem moving further along because uh, without the hard work of these guys, uh, the opportunities wouldn't be there for everybody else. Thanks, Robert. Um, 
Hi, Evan. How are you? All good. Space, space bar not working. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Axel. Yeah, uh, Evan Hollands, I'm a director on the App Exchange and ISV Tech Enablement team at Salesforce. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be part of this event today and to, to hear all the pictures from the, from the founders and good luck to everybody. Uh, a little bit about App Exchange. Uh, for those not familiar, App Exchange is Salesforce's uh, uh, leading enterprise uh, cloud marketplace uh, for solutions. What does that mean? It's really where our customers go to look for uh, add-on solutions uh, to enhance their Salesforce environment. Uh, and I'd love to get the message out there today of Salesforce as a platform for application development. Uh, we have uh, lots and lots of different startups uh, building solutions on the App Exchange uh, and on our Salesforce platform. Um, and uh, in particular, more recently, Salesforce, as uh, some of you may know, has been uh, broadening out into industry plays, uh, and we've been getting a lot of interest uh, in the fintech space. So really keen to see what uh, what people have got today. Thank you. And uh, quickly about myself. So I'm French. You probably guessed with my accent. Uh, Co-founder of Startup and Angels. I've been uh, hosting events, as Leo said, in uh, many cities and countries uh, a bit around the world. I'm an active angel investor as well, but more in uh, emerging market, mostly in Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in different uh, industries, uh, including FinTech as well, which is quite uh, a hot topic as well uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. And uh, yes, once again, we're really happy to, um, to, uh, to be with all of you uh, today. So we'll start uh, with uh, the first uh, startup with uh, Shivani Gopal from The Remarkable Woman. Hi, Shivani. Hi, Axel. I will just get my screen ready. Thanks for oh, having good. me, everyone. Great, thanks so much, Axel. And hello, everyone, and welcome to The Remarkable Woman, your daily habit to career, money, and life success. I founded The Remarkable Woman because my personal experiences made me aware of the global challenges that we women face. I realized that we need to change when I cried to a girlfriend that I didn't feel strong enough to leave my early adult arranged marriage over a decade ago. And she decided to respond, well, how could I even afford to? But yet I was a successful financial advisor at the time and money was the least of my worries. But I couldn't imagine how much harder it would be if I wasn't financially independent. I realized we needed change when as a graduate, I approached someone to mentor me, a senior, who told me to come back if I was still around in 10 years time. You see, there are so many stories like this and it culminates into a problem of epic proportions. In Australia, there is a gender pay gap of 14.2%. Women make up only 17% of Australia's CEOs and occupy just 14% of our board positions. Financially, women retire on around half the superannuation savings than men. And 70% of people, primarily women, confess to experiencing a lack of confidence and experiencing imposter syndrome. But there is a sustainable path to change. Through my own experiences in being a financial advisor for over a decade, to then being a corporate executive, to then coaching and mentoring hundreds of women, I realized this. Empowerment is like a house built on sand, unless you focus on the three foundations of growth, the personal, the professional, and the financial. Because you see, the thing is that women do want to upskill in personal, professional and financial development. They do want to seat at the table. Of course, we want a financial nest egg and we want to feel good about ourselves and have an access to a strong community of like-minded women. But there's a reality that also gets in the way. And that is that women are time poor. They tend to juggle most of the mental load at home. And also they're overwhelmed with the multiple networking options that are out there that offer a bit of this, a bit of that, a business, a bit of business learning, a bit of career learning, but it doesn't meet their overall holistic needs. And it further challenges the fact that they are time poor indeed. So here's how we change that. Introducing the Remarkable Woman, your daily habit app to career, money and life success where we enable women to access mentors, career, money, and life coaching, plus micro courses through videos, through audio courses, tools, and more, all in one handy app. Our mentor matching algorithm means that women can connect with appropriate mentors through a touch of a button, with video and phone conferencing enabled in-app to minimize any friction. 
we also enable women to go from financially literate to financially independent through our raft of financial tools, whether it be money videos, how to, how to save, invest and grow your finances. We are the only EdTech subscription that women need. Women can access video courses on anything from beating imposter syndrome to getting a promotion to managing and growing their finances. And our personal empowerment model gives women access to deep self-awareness surveys, helping them understand themselves better and how to relate to others. We use AI technology to offer women a personalised learning journey that builds sustainable habits of continued learning with nudges, serving them content at the right time of day to help them further learn and grow. After working with hundreds of women, we've learned that no matter how much you actually want to learn, sometimes it's really hard to actually make that happen and last unless the experience is easy and you're served with the right content at the right time. That is exactly how the remarkable woman empowers women. When it comes to the market size, there are over 5.8 million working women in Australia. Over 3 million of them are women working in white collar roles who are generally the, generally the demographic that come to the Remarkable Woman for Empowerment. In an obtainable basis, if we were to penetrate 2% of that market share, it would equate to 62,000 members and over $29 million in annual reoccurring revenue. We have already started in the Australian market and plan to grow in the American, UK and Indian market. But let's take a look at the American market size. There are over 76 million working women in the US. Of that, over 30 million are in some kind of management role. And if we were to penetrate just half a percent of that market, it would equate to over 150,000 members and over $70 million in annual reoccurring revenue. So here's how we commercialize it, our business model. We have an inner circle, which is our freemium offer, and we've already got over 10,000 women in our community. It shows that women are really attracted to what it is that we offer and it's highly relevant to them. Our app is our signature membership-based model, which is our scalable a scalable revenue solution at $39 a month. And we have a more premium offer for executive women at $1,200 a month. All three are already launched and in market. Our growth story has been strong. We launched our inner circle formally in 2019. In October 2020, we finalised our first member hub technology and brought on our first B2B partners as well as our B2B2C partners. If I were to fast forward to now, September 2021, we are revenue generating at $19,000 in monthly recurring revenue, and we're tipped to get to $45,000 in monthly recurring revenue by the end of the year. We will soon start robust marketing campaigns once we finish raising our capital, which is one of the reasons I'm speaking with you today, so that we can not only expand in Australia, but also in the US, UK and India. The team is led by myself. I come from a financial services and leadership background, as well as a, a really experienced senior full staff developer, a head of education in Dr. Ruth Ferraro, and a, a business manager in Emma Plummer. Which brings me to our ask. We're raising capital and we're looking to grow. So we would love to speak to social impact investors who would like to invest in us, as well as anyone who can introduce us to corporate memberships to further our membership footprint. And here's how you can contact me. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Shivani. Thanks. So, uh, judges, if you have uh, questions, feel free to uh, to pitch in any time. Uh, I'll just uh, have a quick first one. So, is it more ed tech or uh, fintech or a mix of both? It's a mix of both, uh, Axel. It's, we, we really are an ed tech, but a, a big pillar of our education um, is around is around the finance. We have so many video courses around money, how to. We have so many tools that are really practical that will help you better budget. It'll show you where your money is going and fully integrated. It'll show you how to invest and it will teach you about stocks and investments and so forth. Um, and, and next growth continue will be to take that to the next level and actually enable women to invest via the, the platform as well. Thanks. Great presentation, Shivana. Uh, question, how many active users have you got at the moment? We, uh, it, active users, we've got uh, 210 active users uh, in terms of paying users. In addition to that, we've got five corporate users. Um, and in addition to that, we've got a, a subscription community, a, a, an email community of over 10,000. And broadly, what's your, um, what's your growth strategy tied to? Our growth strategy is tied to the, the release of our next technology, which is which is this um, the, the which is the app. 
Um, and that'll be that'll be finalised by around International Women's Day next year, which is March 8th, uh, 2022. Um, and then the, the marketing will then kick off off the back of that. Fantastic. And uh, what's your CAC? Your cash it's referencing that- cost? It's it's actually relatively relatively low. The the CAC is around one month's worth of revenue. The CAC is around thirty to forty dollars um, in uh, in in acquisition costs. Fantastic. Thank you, and well done again. Thank you. Um, hi, Shivani. Um, nice speech. Um, I completely uh understand what you are trying to help the the woman out there is really uh, I can relate it very much thank you so much um just wanted to understand from the technology point of view um what like what uh Robert asked just now or or Excel asked just now is a tech uh, like with a spin from the financial um courses that you offer to to the users um where are you now in terms of like um how, how much that you actually fulfill or features that you give to your users in this way? And did you build it in-house yourself on all the solutions and also with the embedded courses? Yeah, um, th- thank you for that. And uh, so, so we are, it, it is confusing. We are very much an, an ed tech that, um, that educates uh, on, on financial uh, elements as well. So there's, there is that growth journey in terms of actual financial products. So there is, so there is that. Um, we've built all our own videos from scratch. Um, yeah, and I, I would describe myself as a learning junkie. I'm a I'm a massive geek, and I never stop learning. I've I've um, I, I've got you know two master's degrees, and and I keep you know I wake up every morning and I read something new and I learn something new, and um, and so a lot of the the courses have been uh, really informed by yours truly, um, and uh, and then we've we've actually created the video courses off the back of that, and part of that was also differentiation. We wanted to make sure that we had. A, a strong, diverse leader actually delivering the content, and someone who had been in women's shoes before, um, had climbed the corporate ladder, had beaten you know her own versions of imposter syndrome, as you can imagine, being the only woman, uh, but also the only woman of color at so many boardroom tables as well, and, and how I actually was able to do so, um, but also to differentiate because there's a lot of you know webinar-based learning out there, so it's you know hey come on board and you know you can access some of our video courses, but it's just a webinar and it's an interview between one person or another. We wanted to make sure we had really strong bite-sized video content that was not just educational but also entertaining, uh, which I call edutainment. So uh, so we created all of that video content ourselves. It's all live. It's all active. Uh, we have we now have hundreds of, of courses that we've built, and it, and it took years. It, I started this in 2016. It took uh, till 2019 to just get a version up. And it took to 2020 to actually finalize the, the member hub technology to actually host it all. Thanks, Shivani. Uh, sorry, Evan, maybe keep the question or another one, I guess, uh, for David. Uh, so, David, if you're uh, ready to share the presentation, David from Assetly. Uh, that's your time now. <laughs> um, so, good afternoon. I'm David Tui from Assetly, a pre seed investment opportunity. To summarise, this pitch is not an offer to invest and don't rely on anything except our information memorandum. I'm an actuary and a financial markets quant. In my former startup business, our hedge fund topped the entire Morningstar Australia database in 2008. And so we lived our version of the big short movie. We achieved an exit for our angel investors, which has bankrolled the Assetly journey. And this time around, we're aiming much higher to redefine the way that people manage their money and build their wealth. The consumer problem is that for people with some complexity, their experience of financial services is fragmented. They have to log into each app separately and there's no data sharing. It's slow, frustrating, there's no big picture view, nothing is integrated. Our thesis is that the future of direct-to-consumer financial services is as a service on a mega platform. The Ernst & Young paper noted here fleshes out this idea in more depth. Assetly is planning to go directly to the ecosystem endgame. There are no truly global players yet because big fintechs have either focused on payments or investing, but not both. The leading companies in this so-called super app space started with a single cheap product and developed a loyal local community. Check out Revolut and Robinhood. So firstly, Assetly can do all this even as a startup because the fintech space has evolved where all products are available from B2B providers. The task then is to integrate the APIs into one system and our gun tech lead has already worked on API integrations projects bigger than Assetly. 
Secondly, to create the user experience, which involves customers interacting with our APIs via their device. In my opinion, financial apps aren't attractive and it can be hard to navigate to where you want. So it won't be hard for us to create a much better user experience. The visionary of Assetly, Alessandro Grana, I assure you is absolutely passionate about revolutionizing the user experience. And he has an encyclopedic knowledge of fintechs that we want to emulate or partner with. Alex started up and managed a bottled water business in Sydney and a gold mine in Peru. And he developed his e-commerce business and marketing skills while working at a company in Hong Kong. Our plan to start in Australia has some tailwinds. Culturally, online investing and trading is more popular than ever. And half of Australia's financial planners are projected to leave the industry between 2018 to 2023, leaving unmet demand for our initial target demographic of self-directed investors and traders. Our chief admin now makes 100K SMSF balance competitive with Big Super, which opens up that whole new class of self-directed customers for whom big super investments are bland. If they want private investments, SMSF. Crypto and NFTs for speculation and income, SMSF. Their own direct property deals, SMSF. A capital injection to expand their side hustle, or well, 5% of their SMSF is available. And then they can use our robo advice and suite of professionally managed accounts to invest the rest. Once investments are better down, then the addition of asset leads, banking, payments, and small business management features, including FX, start to make sense and gain traction. But these are just products. The ultimate vision for Assetly is as an ecosystem, connecting customers with businesses across the globe. We'll partner with local incumbents to use our APIs and website designs in foreign languages and different legal jurisdictions. The ecosystem starts with fostering communities. Then when customers begin looking for advanced assistance, the data gleaned from the usage of services, forums, and articles in the Assetly ecosystem, will best match them up with professionals and businesses, creating a network effect from our two-sided marketplaces, which is the ultimate barrier to competition. The next few slides are a bit detailed, and I apologize if I skip through too fast. The information's on our website. But it's to show we've been busy over the last three years, and we now have all this. The most tangible asset is more than 500 pixel perfect web and mobile page designs, some of which you've seen already in the deck. So then the front end developers can see exactly what they're required to create. The back end developers can see the required information to deliver to those pages. And we have confidence in the planning and costing the IT build. We have seven staff on board. Not too bad for pre-seed company, uh, plus four key advisors. We're on track for our MVP beta launch in July next year. We're raising 750K pre-seed with a 4.3 mil valuation. There's no overhang to disadvantage angel investors because cash investors in all rounds will get the same preferred liquidation preference share class above founders and partners. Assetly's innovative constitution also facilitates listing as early as feasible, selling your shares to anyone and a digitized share register. If we execute our plans, then by comparison with those global peers with valuations over 10 billion, the payoff for pre-seed can potentially be hundreds of times. On our website, we have a 30 second sign up process to access the investor information and reserve your place in the queue. Thank you. Thanks, David. Evan, uh, if you want to start with the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, you, you mentioned like building out the ecosystem. Have you got a, a strategy for attracting or will you need to attract uh, like uh, other financial services to the ecosystem or will you, will you be building out those integrations yourselves? Uh, there's kind of two answers to that. I mean, the, um, the core, I mean, a core, for example, is banking and um, uh, Australian stockbroking and US stockbroking, et cetera. So, we have um, a single partner for each of those, and we've um, already got their, their rate card and lined them up, and they've got um, a range of fintechs that they're already servicing in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And we're um, looking to attract consumers. So we're going for a, a direct to consumer market to start with, but then we aim to roll out uh, to, uh, so for example, financial planners, 
financial planners that um, service um, 30 clients uh, with a um, Australian share portfolio, for example, would be amongst our group of uh, initial businesses that, that we're targeting. Okay. Well, does that answer your question? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think you've sort of redirected me back from a, a technology thing to the, the ecosystem of the community and the, the, the customers and the advisors. So that's, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks, David. Well done. Uh, great presentation. Uh, I didn't quite understand your commercial model, how you guys make money. Oh, it's um, a subscription service. And well, uh, oh, uh, well sorry, it's um, uh, we, we haven't put our prices on, on here. I just thought that'd be a distraction and we'll, we'll see how we go in some regards. But look, the, the, the main idea with um, subscription service, I mean, much like Amazon Prime, is to get people on board and um, work on the um, what uh, we observe that, can, that our consumers want. We'll peel off the next product that, um, that uh, we observe that's um, where we want to go. Uh, we aim to be market leading in terms of the, the pricing. So um, that will obviously be um, something that changes as we go along. Are you charging fees to, from the advisors or are you clipping the ticket on amounts that are invested through the end user? The, uh, the initial is consumers. So we're looking for self-directed, which is not advisors, but that the um, uh, the advisors would, there'd be a, a dual uh, payment structure, some money going to our platform and some money going to the advisors. It, when, when those advisors come on board with their own managed portfolio. Yeah, uh, and the wealth tech space is a fairly competitive space at the moment. Why would advisors come across to Assetly when they're already dealing with the likes of net wealth and a range of other um, established players? Uh, look, you're talking about our second stage. We're not really going for that yet. Um, it's not really something that we're, <laughs> you know, look, there's about 12 different things that we're aiming to do. And I just want to focus on the, on the first stage, which is the self-directed. Okay. And, and then like those, um, to answer that in, in that roundabout way, um, uh, advisors can't advise on crypto, for example, because uh, it's outside the scope of professional insurance. And then just finally, how are you going to build trust? With, you're a new player, no brand equity in the market, unknown. How are you going to acquire customers? Uh, we've got a range of strategies, um, one of which is to um, have a um, crowdfunding platform. Um, first capital for rank would be uh, Assetly Seed or Series A. And, um, and as we've seen with some other um, startups in Australia, um, Superhero, for example, Australia's cheapest um, share trading um, attracts people. Uh, I've been a member of four different uh, quant trading communities and uh, those communities look for a modern tech stack that they can hook up their algos with and uh, cheapest uh, cost. So if we can get both of those, I'm, I think we're confident we can get that. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. So uh, I'll keep the schedule on time. Uh, hi, Lisa from uh, Clear Platform. If you're uh, ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lisa Carter. Thanks for having me this afternoon. I'll just uh, share my screen. Thank you. OK, I'm the uh, founder and uh, sole director of Clear Platform. And with, uh, behind me is a, a team of experts uh, that um, have been advising me on, the, um, on my journey to date. Uh, so I'm a uh, commercial insurance and risk advisor. I've been um, in, in that um, career for over 25 years. And um, I have founded Clear Platform uh, simply from listening to uh, the gripes and Growings, if you like, of my existing um, client base in my commercial broking, um, commercial insurance broking business. So the team that I have behind me, uh, if I've got a, a CTO advising me on the tech and um, financial advisors and very experienced um, uh, commercialization experts and angels here in the Brisbane um, community. So um, meet Simone. Simone is a, um, a busy business owner. She, uh, she runs a busy bakery and she wants to arrange insurance and finance for her business. Uh, she's extremely frustrated by the amount of time it takes her to complete 
forms and deal with all the different advisors that she needs to uh, in order to, to buy insurance and um, arrange finance for her business. She's uh, extremely frustrated, thinks that there's got to be a better way. Where's my information going? I don't know who sees it, what they do with it when I fill in these forms and submit them. Why, why is she being asked for the same information over and over? Um, and then how does she know that, that her information um, is secure? So this is just an example of um, the uh, concerns and frustrations that I hear on a day-to-day -day basis from, from any uh, business owner who is um, trying to manage the risk in their business. So what Clear Platform uh, does is it effectively gives back control time and confidence to the consumer. So it allows in uh, it allows consumers to, to have control of their information and it enables faster and more accurate communication between all of the stakeholders. Uh, the customer can own their data and they can um, see who, who sees it, where it's gone, and um, that control uh, for the consumer. So the model is, is effectively a, a SaaS uh, platform and the users of, of the platform are consumers and brokers and advisors. So the, the paying customer would initially be the brokers and the advisors and then, of course, the, the consumers as well. Uh, so we're looking at a, a two-pronged approach of attracting customers, uh, consumers direct to the platform and also then for brokers and advisors to invite them onto the platform. Uh, and there'll be multiple payment uh, options available uh, to users, whether it be a monthly or annual subscription fee. Uh, so where we're at at the moment is uh, we've developed a, a clickable prototype. Uh, we've completed market testing in uh, my existing uh, insurance brokerage business. Uh, we're in the process of building the MVP and we've identified MVP user groups. So the opportunity is, um, is extensive. There's the uh, Australian general insurance market uh, of $70.2 billion and the global insurance market of 3.6 trillion euros. So where we're at is um, building the MVP and testing in user groups. And the way we're going to scale the business is to initially grow with like-minded advisors who are highly customer focused, who uh, have uh, the same view as, as I do it in that uh, we need to move to a, um, an advice model where we're uh, advising consumers on how to best manage their risks and arrange their finances. And that's all in line with the coming changes of the Royal Commission into the general insurance industry this uh, next year. So the future is to uh, grow naturally and then to expand to English speaking countries and then look uh, to become a global solution. Uh, and effectively the, the platform is uh, a reg tech uh, platform that um, will enable both the uh, insurance and, and finance industries. So at the moment, we're launching the seed round and seeking um, seed capital and potential partnerships uh, from investors. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, maybe uh, Youngling or uh, Evan, if you have um, some questions, if you want to start. Yeah. Um, what What is the innovative idea behind it? What, how do you... Uh, address competition. Who are your competitor, maybe uh, in short? Well, uh, I would say the competitors would be the existing um, incumbents in the um, insurance market, of which there are many. So uh, obviously, uh, insurance companies and um, insurance brokerage firms, uh, as well as uh, any any company in the um, in the finance um, and banking industry. So uh, there, like any industry, there's always competition and uh, I couldn't sit here and say that there's no competition 
Um, but I, what I know that um, our focus is heavily on the consumer and really addressing the problems that they're experiencing. The customer experience in the insurance and finance industries at the moment is dreadful. It's, it's just got to be better. There's, there's got to be a better way of delivering risk and insurance advice and financial products to consumers. Okay, thank you. Do you have any, um, because you are still in the prototype and also building your MVP, so what's mm -hmm. the strategy to get um, your customers, uh, knowing that the competition is so high? Yeah, so the, uh, the strategy is to test the MVP in my existing insurance brokerage business and to partner with like-minded insurance uh, broking businesses. Uh, that are um, forward thinking and understand the changes that are coming with the uh, Royal Commission into the general insurance industry. Great presentation, Lisa. Quick question. Um, have you validated that brokers are prepared to pay for this service? And secondly, you, are you guys going to require an AFSL or how do you intend to operate as a licensed financial service provider? Yeah, look, that, um, that is a, um, an option that we'll need to work through as we build the MVP. The, the, the product is not a um, insurance product platform. It's purely a data management platform. Uh, so there'll be no quoting or binding or placement of any insurance products via the platform. Uh, so at the moment, my view is that we won't require an AFSL. Um, but if that is required, then we would simply apply for one. And, and have you done your sorry your validation for bro have, have you any market testing regarding the preparedness of brokers to pay for a, a fee for use the platform? Oh, absolutely. Yeah the the um the you the market testing is loud and clear. Anything that helps uh, insurance brokerages reduce their headcount and administration costs and um, improves their compliance, um, it's a um, they're very happy to buy it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And uh, so we'll switch to, I think you can uh, stop sharing the, the presentation and we'll uh, switch to uh, Tim from Pencil Pay. Hi, Tim. How are you? There we go. Good. Yourself? Good. Thanks. Very so, good. Uh, Very yeah, good. Five minutes. <laughs> no worries. Hey, everyone. I'm Tim. I'm the CEO and co founder of Pencil. We're a B2B SaaS platform that helps wholesalers take their trade accounts online. So all the way from application to payment. Um, I might just spend a couple of minutes early giving you a bit of an overview of the problem that we're tackling. So you've all been to a cafe, you buy a coffee and you pay for it before you leave. But you think about the suppliers of the milk, the coffee cups and the coffee, they won't get paid for anywhere up to 30 days. This is called trade credit. And every year in Australia alone, there's tens of thousands of small and medium wholesalers supplying 1.3 trillion worth of goods on trade credit with zero expertise in running a credit business. If you think about a personal loan application, I'd have to provide a bunch of stuff. So 100 points of ID, a signed contract, a risk assessment, personal guarantee, and a bank account to debit the repayments from. You notice that all of this happens at the point of application. Then you've got B2B wholesale credit applications. Um, buyers fill in up to 50 of these when they open their shop. Then a bunch more every time they get a new supplier. But here's the problem. So, they're long and they're repetitive. Buyers actually don't fill them out properly. They miss IDs and they miss signatures and most don't provide a payment method. So why? Because they're paper-based. There's no validation and they really don't know who they're giving credit to. And the results are exactly what you'd expect. Half of payments actually come late and 40 billion um, worth of payments never come at all. And they actually turn into bad debt. And I'm here because I've experienced it. So firstly, supplier side, um, being owed millions from debtors, and then buyer side when um, I'd filled in 20 paper credit applications for a cafe. It, so in my previous business, we'd onboarded about 20,000 customers digitally with signatures and sensitive information. So initially, I knew the type of change that was needed um, was actually possible. And secondly, I knew the type of impact that it would have for suppliers and their customers. So I gave Greg a call. He, um, he had a team of developers working on projects for some big Aussie brands like Aesop, Adore Beauty and Bunnings. 
And after chatting um, through the problem a little bit more, we, I guess, had our aha moment where the credit applications hadn't changed in 20 years, even though 90% of SMEs were already using cloud accounting and cloud inventory and e-commerce was absolutely exploding. So um, if you think about the process of credit applications, it's a widely accepted process and it's actually mandated by the supplier. So we just had to become the process. And to date, what we've done is sign up 2,000 buyers, 1,000 in the last four months, with signed contracts, security or a personal guarantee, and a safe payment method for auto billing on the due date. And that is what's driving our business model, where we sign up a supplier and they pay a subscription. So, and then on the right, you can see as the supplier onboards more and more um, new and existing buyers onto Pencil, they'll process more and more payments. So the revenue earned from each supplier actually compounds over time. So where can we take it? You really need to look at the three big exits in our space of the year. So Deer Systems, Unleashed and Trade Gecko. They're all cloud inventory systems. They all sold for north of 100 mil and they all had 3,000 to 4,000 subscriptions when they sold. And they were all doing around about a million a month in revenue, some slightly more. Um, so for, for a little bit of perspective, this calendar year, we'll do 100 new subscriptions with zero marketing budget and a sales team of me. So with, I guess with the right funding, 3,000 subscriptions in three years is a really achievable mark. So how do we do it? Firstly, the users of DA and Unleash who I just spoke about are SME inventory suppliers. So naturally what we've done is partner with them, their cloud accounting ecosystem and their implementation partners. Um, the ecosystem is about 15,000 businesses strong and they're from our direct target market. So then we'll go into further integrations with NetSuite and Dynamics, we're starting NetSuite next week. And that opens up a huge group of mid-market suppliers for us. So obviously more yield. The second area is location. So Australia's got 55,000 suppliers and the US has 410,000 suppliers. And we've already got five suppliers over there ready to go. It's just a matter of building the payments integration, which we're working on at the moment. And thirdly um, is a mix of paid search and social underpinned by a really strong content strategy for that organic growth. And last but not least is product led. So we've had a little bit of luck with this recently, which is great. So when a supplier signs up um, a buyer and the buyer thinks I could use this and they end up signing up as a supplier. What we've shown is consistent double figure growth month on month since February. So now what we're doing is raising our first significant round to be able to grow. Um, the areas that we've got to scale, sales, so partnerships, marketing, content, paid ads, um, our after sales support for platform adoption, which is a massive revenue driver, and our product team to keep improving the platform for users. Um, thanks for listening, everyone. Um, if there's any areas that you want to dig into, please, uh, please ask. Thanks, Tim. How much are you uh, raising? Uh, one and a half. We're, um, we're about we're 350 in, and we're, um, we're raising a further 1.15. Uh, yeah, thank you. And so you answered quickly about the, the question in the pitch, but uh, so your uh, system is easily uh, uh, applicable in other markets, right? Absolutely. So you think about trade credit, it's a, it's a, very, um, it's a very common problem. Uh, it's a common problem everywhere, to be honest. Um, certainly the US and the UK, uh, two markets that we've looked at, and then the US is the one market that we've really tested. Um, and uh, to be able to go over there and, and, and deploy the platform, all we need is to plug in a payments system. And we've just, um, we've just done a deal this week with an international payment provider. So we'll have um, the ability to, um, to operate in nine jurisdictions. Great, thanks. Maybe Evan? Yeah, yeah. so Tim, you, you said that uh, revenue is from subscriptions to the platform. Do you flip tickets on the, like the, the payments that are going through the platform as well? Yeah, so it's subscriptions plus payments plus plus we, we do a little bit of revenue from credit reporting, but um, the vast majority of the revenue is, so payments is number one, about 65%, subscriptions is about 30%, and, um, and, um, and uh, credit reporting is about 5%. And those payments, um, if you think about the average revenue per supplier, we've gone from 140 at the start, or about since in February, up to 200, we're at $200 a month per supplier, um, at the moment. So that's continues to increase as they onboard more and more of their customers. And, and what kind of returns are, are suppliers seeing when they adopt the platform? Have you got any metrics around like reductions in uh, costs and payments, et cetera? 
Yeah, so um, there's two core areas. So the first is the reduction in headcount. So um, we're only dealing with SME suppliers. So there's SME suppliers, they might have two, two to three people in accounts and administration. Um, what they're seeing is they can scale and certainly over the last couple of weeks, we've seen a large volume of customers enter the platform because of um, because everyone's out of lockdowns. So all sales teams are back out there selling. So what we've seen is they are very easily putting more and more customers on without any extra headcount, which is really good to see. So that's the first area. And the second area is the speed in which they get paid. So, so because we are you know, capturing and tokenizing their credit card details or storing their bank account details against the customer, as soon as the due date hits, they can charge. So we've seen about a 30% reduction, certainly in the brewery area, which we're, we've got about 20 um, craft breweries on the platform. And in that area, we've seen a huge reduction in, uh, in, in, in payment days. Great, thank you. Uh, great presentation there, Tim. Uh, what's your moat? What you, what you, what's your defensibility in this solution? Yeah, so um, for us, for us, our defensibility, if you look at the competition, you, you think about who else is out there, you've got Apply Easy and One Center, um, their credit application software, but I guess the verticals they focus on um, have really different characteristics. They deal much in much larger industrial and um, you know, construction, manufacturing, you know, mid-market, larger scale production. Um, so, and due to the size of their invoices, they don't process payments because their invoices are much larger and they, they do progress payments. So, Really, um, the key difference between us and them is that um, we do payments and they don't. And we focus on a really, really um, targeted sector. So turnover under 100 million with a large volume of customers, invoices 10K and under, and that's so FMCG, alcohol, health, fashion, et cetera. Um, and the, the, the main comp competitor is Easy Collect. Um, but the, again, they've got workflows and a business model that's really designed to, I guess, pester the overdue customer into submission with an email or SMS reminder. So um, they don't you know, tokenize those payment details at the start to be able to process later on. And we feel like that is the main, the main, uh, the main change. And as far as, um, as far as cost to switch, the cost for a supplier to switch is enormous because they've spent all of this time onboarding all their customers with a safe payment method. And if they try and switch over to another platform, it's too expensive and it takes too long. Oh, sticky. Yeah, very sticky platform. Yep. Yeah, we've got we've got a 90, 91, 92% retention rate of customers from, from trial to, to you know holding on to a subscription. And quick one to onboard uh, uh, consumers, uh, to onboard uh, businesses on the platforms. You need a bit of uh, on-ground activities in each uh, location or uh, you can do it remotely. I'm sorry? To onboard uh, customers. Uh, yep. You need uh, underground activities to meet the customers, or it can be done remotely. No, so um, so we we do it all remotely. Every every sale that we've done for the platform, except for our first one, yep. were, um, has been has been done by Zoom. Zoom was um, if you think about the pandemic, it was it was actually a bit of a bit of a positive for us because it got everyone onto Zoom. So it meant we could, you know, we could um, sign up customers that way, um, and certainly. Um, customers can sign up on their own as well. So we've worked really hard on trying to get it to a point where we don't have to be involved in the sign up process and we just can help them adopt over time. Um, we're, we're almost there. Um, you know, we've got customers signing up, but in terms of configuration and customization of the platform, they still need a bit of a hand. Great. One quick question. What, what terms are you using? What, what, struck, what instrument are you raising? Are you, is, this a, is it a price ground? Uh, yeah, straight equity. Um, uh, we're raising one and a half on a five and a half um, pre-money, and we're, um, as I said, we're about we're about twenty, you know, twenty five percent of the way into the raise um, from a from a from a cash perspective. Great, thanks, uh, Tim. Uh, Thank you. Uh, great Cheers. presentation. So we'll move to uh, some uh, advice uh, during the next five minutes. Uh, while we'll, uh, we're compiling the, the, the scores for the votes. Uh, maybe I'll start as, um, quickly. Uh, maybe a quick one, uh, Lisa, for uh, your pitch. Uh, I noticed you started with the, uh, the second slide was about the team. I would say it's just uh, hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to do the presentation, but maybe to have the team, I would say a bit uh, further uh, and start really with the problem. Uh, the solution, what your uh, 
bringing in there, etc. And then uh, after that, to have the team uh, presentation to support uh, what you've said before around once again the problem, the solution, your product, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would recommend more to put it at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just a quick, uh, a quick uh, uh, advice from myself. Maybe uh, Rob, if you have a, for anyone. I'll just Jen broadly, which was a great presentation, Scott. It's always hard to get in front of everyone and and uh, and, and put forward your, your ideas and your concepts and articulate them strongly. Um, bring as much track and as, traction as you can up front to your presentation, enabling um, the audience to understand exactly um, what you've achieved to date. Revenue is obviously key, but if you pre-revenue, any other key traction marker points such as um, customer or client acquisition um, as well. Uh, what your MVP is actually delivered. Uh, what else you need to build out to build to create it more more scalable and and more commercial. Um, sure, you clear on your, your your market size, your attractiveness, because ultimately you're playing for, you know, investors are looking to support a venture that's going to be a number one player in a big market. And so if you can demonstrate that market size and why you guys are going to achieve it, that's fantastic. Um, never underestimate promoting your team um, as operators, founders, um, the, the, the tech side as well, if it's, certainly if it's, a, if it's a tech focus there as well. Uh, and also if you can get a sense of just some of your key metrics, such as in the early stages, it's all around the survival. So if you're able to give some ideas around your burn rates as well, that's always helpful as well. Maybe a quick one from uh, Evan and uh, Yan Ling, maybe around the technical side or the product. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from a, from a product perspective, I always look out for um, like a really clear value proposition. You know, what what problems are you solving? Who are you solving them for? Help me understand uh, immediately who the who the customer is and who your segments are. Um, Emily, do you have anything? Yeah, quite similar uh, from a technical perspective. And so I like uh, to probably hear a little bit more in terms of like the product roadmaps and what you're planning to bring um, in, in the next um, stage that in, in your launching and all, and what are you trying to achieve and how you can actually support the market um, needs as well with your solution. But generally, um, all pictures are really good. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone. So I'll... Uh... Uh, hand it over again to uh, Leo. Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for all of you who voted. Uh, we will uh, maybe leave you another um, 10 seconds to uh, finalize your vote for the Public Choice Award, uh, winning basically to be featured on our Startup and Angel podcast available on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, wherever you get your, uh, your podcast juice from. Uh, and I don't know if I can share actually the output um, of the judges vote. So Axel, I can be guided by you, otherwise we'll know uh, a bit too much details, um, but um, a big, big thanks to, uh, to our judges. Uh, we've been uh, using an evaluation matrix at the back. Uh, so quick reminder that the winner will win one year membership to the OVH Cloud Startup Program, including uh, a check of $15,000, just over $15,000 of OVH Cloud products. And the runner up will get a $2,000 check with Australians or company. Um, to assist, you know, grow into new markets, uh, build a rockstar team, uh, you know, just find new customers through network. Um, so without further ado, um, maybe we can release uh, the results, Axel, with the, the winner. So uh, winner is uh, Pencil Pay. So team, uh, congrats. Thank uh, you. Great presentation. Uh, then we'll have uh, number two, uh, Shivani with the remarkable uh, woman. Uh, on the third spot, uh, Assetly, uh, and then uh, Clear Platform. So uh, thanks again uh, for uh, pitching. Uh, as uh, Rob said, it's a really a great uh, exercise to do it. I really encourage you to do it uh, 
as much as possible. As you can think, I've been doing that myself with a French accent. It's not that easy. So, uh, but it's a great exercise, definitely. Uh, yeah, I guess at the end of the day, you need to speak about your startup as much as possible. So, um, so yeah, thanks everyone. And now we'll uh, release the winner or the, the survey results for uh, the, your choice, basically the public choice. Well done, team again from Pencil Pay. Thank you. Uh, so we'll be spending some time together recording a podcast episode. So thank you very much. A big uh, virtual uh, round of applause for you know, claps. all our startup founders. <laughs> Uh, and definitely uh, looking forward to being in touch, you know, giving you uh, a bit more data, you know, on how you went today uh, so you can improve your pitch and, you know, uh, achieve your fundraising goals and growth goals uh, in the coming months. Um, so thank you so much. And, um, and no. And maybe quick question, uh, team, uh, last question to do a transition with the next one. So about the exit strategies, you've said acquisition, but uh, what about the ASX listing? No, I think um, if I if I take history as the best example, I'll look at I'll look at similar businesses that have exited in our space, and they've all all, all three all three major ones this year have been trade have been trade sales. So uh, unless we get folded in somewhere, it's um it would, would no doubt look like a trade sale. Thanks. So I guess uh, Ryle and uh, David will be able to uh, cover a bit more uh, this topic. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks again and uh, well done team, Shivani, Lisa and David. So now I'll uh, end over to uh, David, uh, David Kenny, uh, one of our uh, partner, uh, one of definitely one of my mentor and source of inspiration, the host of the great podcast Sanity Check. Uh, check it out and uh, today he will be uh, interviewing uh, Ray Ross, the co-founder of Button. Uh, up to you, David. Thanks, Leah. Thanks, everyone. G'day, Rail. David, how are you? What I'm an up. Good. What an up. I've been treating you. I heard you've been a little bit tied up. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, you know, obviously the. Uh, I think from the pictures today, we can see the sort of the up and comings in, in the fintech space is, is coming hard and strong. I mean, you know, we're, we're in a good position, obviously, being sort of two years into the two years ahead of the game in our obviously our platform lending space, etc. But I think uh, after this afternoon and seeing sort of some of the founders that are coming through today and some of the opportunities that are you know trying to be uh, picked up in that particular space, I think it, it's uh, it's a very much watch this space. Uh, fintech uh, angle. Did you get a bit of deja vu for going through some of these, listening to some of these pitches and saying, I had that problem? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think it was actually a bit more uh, accurate than that was being there, done that. Um, you know, I remember these pitches. Um, you know, I think we did at one stage, we did, I think, 50 or 60 in, in, in a week, literally back to back five days. So um, I, I know what it takes, been there, done that. Um, very, very, very interesting pitches uh, this afternoon, I think. And obviously, uh, Tim stood out in the crowd from the um, from the uh, results that sort of pushed through. But um, I think across the board, you know, fintech is here to stay. Um, lending and platforms are here to stay. And, and uh, that, that's the future, especially in, in the landscape, what we're seeing now. 100%. So, look, I guess for everyone's um, benefit, can you give us a bit of the button story? Like, I mean, I don't know um, how many of you use the platform, obviously have a look at it, but straight from the founder, give us the, the button story. What's exactly this button do and how does it help customers? And Sure. Look, um, we, like to, we like to believe that um, we created or leading the path in what we call platform lending in a B2B environment. Um, the B2C market is, is somewhat saturated. Um, the B2B is, is new, it's a niche. Um, it's, uh, it's larger across the world in, in relation to ticket sizes, et cetera. Uh, Button was built to partner. Button is not a standalone product. Everything we do, um, we take partnership models. We do origination distribution digitally on a mass scale through various third-party partners. Uh, we're not Johnny come lately. We've been around now um, probably five, six years. In the last two years, we've really, you know, solidified our, our, I guess, our fintech solution button. 
And, um, you know, if you look back, I guess, over the last five years, 700 odd million of, of receivables and um, total transactional value funding to date, I guess, gives it that bit of a flavor that, you know, if you really do build up that, that level and you build up over time, when you finally get to market or, or to the capital markets like we have, you know, over the last couple of months, you can see that we have the track record to follow and uh, continue on that on that growth path. Yeah, 100%. So speaking of, I mean, as you, you touched on the B2C market being saturated, but is it really even? I mean, obviously, Afterpay have got competitors, Scalar Pay, go to Italy, doing Zip. There's there's so many that are coming through. And obviously, this is inspiring a lot of founders that are even on today's uh, pitches to, to look at the opportunities. Do you think it is really saturated? Because to win in this market, it's not easy, but differentiation and execution are the key things that I think you'll probably share. And, and can we talk a bit about why you think this market is still a good one to be going down? Because with all that com competition, what are you getting right that makes you continue that? Obviously, this is you're an ASX listed company, so I don't want you to be <laughs> compromising any. This is not an announcement or, or <laughs> your disclosure issue, but what can you share with us that you know, makes you think you're on the right track here? Sure. Um, a couple of reasons, I think. Number one, as I sort of touched on before, this platform lending, this, this funding play, what we're seeing now in the B2C space is already a lot of consolidations. Um, there's, like you said, there's a lot of players that have, you know, various little niches or, you know, twings and twangs and, you know, the outsides are, are, um, are manipulated and, and changed to fit certain models. But at the end of the day, the B2C space is, is the buy now, pay later, small ticket sizes, fixed fees coming off over say four weeks or five weeks or six weeks. And you look at the business space where we're playing or the B2B space, especially where Button is now, we have a suite of funding products within that same B2B environment. So our model is once we integrate into a platform and there are hundreds, thousands, millions of business users within our Button ecosystem, we have various products eat them along the way. Whether it's trade finance, whether it's invoice finance, whether it's debt of finance, whether it's commissions on demand, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we're strong believers that um, we have this ability to propagate our products within one business unit, whereas opposed to in a B2C environment, if you attack that customer with a buy now, pay later product, a B2C, that's it. They're going to use that product and they might come back and repeat that product, but there's no other product that you can get them at that point in time. Whereas when a, a business clicks on button and literally gets that funding, excuse the pun, at the click of a button, at that point in time, they have access to a full suite of funding products, allowing them to stay on that, on that platform, allowing them to stay in that button environment and not go outside that environment to say Google to find a lender or go to their bank to find money. It's all within that same ecosystem. And that really is the, the, the difference in button. And that's what we're seeing within the B2B space. Look, I've heard a lot of people talk about the, the power of this platform today, but what should be in that platform? So, you know, you don't necessarily get your meat where you get your bread, get, you know, so you've got everything from factoring to uh, loans to pay your agent box commission straight away. Right. And I guess what, how, how do you, and for the benefit of us, that some of the people that have pitched that, how do you go about thinking about what, does go together for a platform what how do you have you thought about the building of your platform yeah i think uh, i'll raise another point that so as i as i listen today to the um to the pictures on the market and, and some of the questions that the that the founders were getting this afternoon were what's your market what's your go-to-market strategy how are you going to attack those consumers etc what we did is we went and built a product knowing we had our market in place already. And that, that really is the difference, I think. And if you build a product and, and go to try find your market, you're gonna struggle, especially now that there are so many players out there. There's so many different platforms out there. There's so many different nuances within those platforms and so many people trying to do partnerships. But if you have that key, I guess that key go to market strategy at day one, and when you finish your platform, you can turn on X number of clients or three or four and five, not build it out for a year, then try to find your clients because you'll find yourself behind the eight ball. And I think that's, that really is, the, I guess, the key differentiator of what we did with Button back in the day, where when we finished building it, we already had clients. We, were, we went to market with clients. We were live with clients and that put us on the right path sort of circa now two years later when we have um, MYOB with, with their sort of over a million clients. We have, as you touched on some of the other ones we've, we've launched recently, Agent Box with their over 2,000 agencies, uh, Ola, 
uh, another uh, large international partner with over 100,000 um, ABN holders just in Australia alone. So when we when we went and built out this button technology, we knew exactly where we're going to put it, what industry we're going to plug into, and how many users are in that industry. And that sort of accelerated our growth phenomenally. Well, I mean, that's what you did. But in terms of helping founders now, and you said we started with the customers. If you had to, if you're starting now and listening to some of these pitches, I mean, for someone who's done this and built a model and built a platform and got the technology and building the APIs, and you bootstrapped for many years, what would you, if you were sitting down with some of these founders that are building a great platform, what would you think their first few steps are? Because I'm a big believer in making sure that in the early days, you really learn how to allocate capital, which is both money and time. Exactly right. Look, we're, and, and, and you're right in what you said. We, we did bootstrap, uh, myself and my co-founder, co-director Walter Rappaport. Um, we didn't take an outside set until we IPO'd or pre-IPO and then IPO. So we, we bootstrapped it. Um, we borrowed, obviously, we're, we're a debt business, so we had to borrow to lend. Um, we cash flowed the business for the last five years over the sort of the 700 million odd that we funded to date. So um, I'd, what I'd say to the founders it, across the board, even today, I'd say stop what you're doing and sign up a client and then build the platform with that client together. Because there's no point building a platform today, launching a platform and then trying to figure out who's going to use it, where your client base is and where your revenue is. But if you build it with a client from day one, you know that as soon as you finish that platform, you have a, what the market wants, you have a revenue stream from day one and you have a user base from day one. And if you don't have a user base from day one and you're looking around for users, you're just going to burn money. And what you know what happens when you burn money, David. <laughs> Welcome to insolvency or, or good night, Irene. <laughs> totally. So in terms of the pl platform you built, I mean, can you take us back to some of the systems? And do you remember even what those first five systems were that you adopted? Because I think that really does set you on the right direction or not. Can you remember some of those? Um, I can remember the main... I think the main the main lesson that came out of it was everyone talks now about APIs. APIs is the buzzword. And we're going to take our APIs and we're going to plug into other APIs and those APIs are going to take other APIs and we're going to push data and we're going to pull data, et cetera. What we found was that unless your APIs are agnostic, they're useless. So you can plug in an API, find another platform or a partner to plug in. You say, I've got the best APIs. And they come back to you and say, well, actually, these APIs don't fit with our, within our ecosystem. They don't fit within our environment. And then suddenly you're going back scrambling and rebuilding different APIs or you're rebuilding your technology stack from, from scratch because it doesn't work. So I think what, what we did and we did it in, in, the right, in the right way was when we set out again with our customers to build the product, we built our agnostic technology. We built our agnostic APIs, industry agnostic, so that we could literally go plug and play. And as we sort of tongue in cheek, we say, we'll plug, play, and we'll, we'll pay you today. So uh, we, you know, we have that ability now to plug into any third party platform, literally, as you can see across our diverse, um, across our diverse range. So let's look across the board, Ola, automotive, agent box, real estate, ready pay, real estate, NYOB, Myob, um, owned by KKR, accounting software. These are all running off the same APIs. They're all running off the same credit matrix. They're all running off the same um, less than five minute onboarding piece. Um, after that, you know, one click away, you instant funding. So what we've actually done and we've, what we've managed to build, and again, what I'd say to anyone that asked me, you know, what, what's my next play? Agnostic technology that you can plug and play because otherwise you're going to just be recoding, recoding, re-technology, redeveloping, and then suddenly, again, your costs go up. You need more tech teams because you're trying to integrate, you're trying to build at the same time, and then eventually uh, you've got no revenue and you're still trying to figure out what product you're going to market with. That's a great point that, you know, you're really thinking about what customers are going to come on and minimise feature creep until you really have enough people in there to think about the next feature rather than to make it agnostic. I think it's a really good piece of advice. Um, you, you mentioned your IPO'd. Um, I mean, we, we hear in Australia, and I guess the global phenomenon is capital raising and... Um, what took you to the, the public arena versus staying in, you know, doing a, a series A, series B, et cetera? What was the key thing for you to decide? And, and what, 
for anyone, do you think are some of the key questions to ask? Sure. Um, as I sort of touched on before, my, myself and my co-founder, Walter, um, we bootstrapped from day one and we had, you know, we had a very good business. We had, you know, um, big um, strategic um, client bases in automotive and FMCG and others. And I think from our point of view, what we always said was if we started to sell down too early or we started to raise money too early, we'd lose control. We'd lose that ability to get that entrepreneurship over and above what we needed to do. And we're a big believer. We started to build button maybe two and a half years ago, two years ago, something like that. And we're a big believer. And we've, we've discussed in the office a number of times that if we would have gone down this route with, um, you know, this investment or this route with it, with this PE group, et cetera, we wouldn't have been able to build button because they would have had a say in everything. They would have said, well, you're a factoring company. Why are you going to digitize or why are you going to build out this or why, why do you think this partnership? So all these questions slow you down. So what we did is we took the other route. We said, we're going to bootstrap till, till we can't bootstrap anymore. We're going to go and build out button from our own cash flow. And then suddenly we hit the, the point in time where we've got all these large partnerships like the Ollas of the world coming to us and saying this, you know, we believe this technology is the bees needs, this platform lending plays the next, the next wave. And uh, obviously we, we, we looked at ourselves in the mirror, myself and Walter, and we said, well, you know, what's our play now? So we're too late to do series, eh? We've already got a, you know, five, I think at that stage, probably 500 million of, of transactional value or something like that, or 400, 500. So we're already down the path, past C, past A, et cetera. So the next step for us was we've got to capitalize on these partnerships. We have to, we have to go and attack the capital markets. And that's how we sort of ended up in that position. I'm going to put you up a bit there because I, I mean, we're seeing some pretty big valuations in private in, in the venture capital world anyway. I mean, is it sometimes who you meet, or because honestly, there's lots of other examples of companies that have not IPO'd and raised big checks. Um, when you think about you know getting weighed every day, as I call it, being on the ASX and saying, "What's my share price today? What's my long-term incentive plan today looking like?" Do my I've never, I've never seen the share price. From the, yeah, from the share price. <laughs> this can be distracting. Like everything's distracting. Yeah, you said you, you know, it's not unusual to have done fifty pitches and, sure. um, and you know, having you know a, a real is it was it did it come to key investors pushing you in a certain way or what? Because like, I mean, I, I just don't buy the ASX is definite versus not. I mean, I feel like that was a, you know, I don't want to pick on you, but I felt like that was an easy answer to say, well, that's what we did and it must have been the right decision. So, yeah. because there's lots of other money out there and lots of other good investors that will add a lot of value to the process and, and bring other, what I call bench strength. But the ASX, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a perfectly good institution, but, but really looking at, you know, what, how much money you'd spent, which you said, well, we've done all this, we've got this, line of credit through i guess a warehouse or bank etc is it is it seriously that's that's just it that's to me it's that question of asx versus series b is is you've got any other clarifications for how close you came because you know most people have to say no to certain things they don't just go great i've got one offer i'll take it so how did you decide sure look we had um we had a number of offers over the years, like I said, we, we ran a, a very good business, we ran a profitable mm -hmm. business. Um, we had a good client base. Um, our our uh, losses were, were negligible, you know, year on year. So, so we knew what we were doing. We had a number of knocks on the door. Um, and you're right, exactly what you said. Um, sometimes the number wasn't right. Sometimes the partnership wasn't right. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we were scared we'd lose control of what we wanted to do. Um, and again, a lot of the, like you said, there's a lot of money out there and now we're starting to see it. I mean, remember this was- Different time. Exactly right. I mean, I was about to say, if you look back sort of two years when we started building this and then, you know, the world went into COVID mode and everyone pulled back, I mean, and, and we still continue to, to maintain our numbers and grow. So it was, it was definitely a different market. And if I was going to market today, you're right, maybe off the, off, the, off the back of COVID now, things are starting to look and there's a lot of money, you know, swishing around. People are looking for a home. Um, with their money and the, and the high returns and the high yields, et cetera. It, it's definitely a different market. But what I can say is that, you know, we had the courage of our convictions from day one. And, and as you sort of touched on, we came very, very close a number of times where, you know, we had the pen in our hand ready to sign. And then, you know, we took a step back and looked at it for, you know, from a holistic point of view and said, no, we, you know, we're, 
this is what we want to do. This is what we got. We have, you know, um, this is what we're going to build with Button. This is our vision. We know it's going to work. We have these partners lined up, ready. We're building the product with them together. Um, and and you're right again that at the end of the journey, the end of the rainbow, for us, the IPO route, the pre-IPO that that um, that model um, served us in the best light. And off the back of that, I mean, we've had, and you can see, we've had you know huge strategic partnerships and. You know, please God, more to come as well. So, um, and we we believe that part of that is is that you know the oversight, the governance, the AS, you know, the listing rules that come with being listed, etc. So, you know, there are some sort of, I guess, parameters that come in the listed world that that you don't get in the in the private world. But you do get other good things like acquisitions might be a bit easier. M and A currency to say, hey, would you like to buy? You'd like to sell to us, and guess what? You get listed ASX shares, so they're you know reasonably Correct. liquid. For example, are you is is acquisition of anything part of your strategy going forward? And and how do you think about you know um, partners, for example? Because a lot of these people that have big platforms, I, I sort of contrast someone like a um, Shopify, which has every piece of the infrastructure is a Shopify piece, whereas I contrast that to big commerce. And they'll partner with a lot of people. So how do you think about own the whole stack or partnering? And, and that's a question, I guess, for, you know, because I could have pushed out, pulled you up a bit and say bootstrap, but how much money is involved in bootstrapping? Can you partner with people or should you think I need to own the entire channel? Look, Button was built to partner. Yep. Everything Button's done from day one has been a partnership model. Um, my partner, Walter, always says, you know, we don't have the monopoly of wisdom. If we had the monopoly of wisdom, we wouldn't need partners. We wouldn't need anybody else. We do everything ourselves. So um, the fact that we can leverage off these partnerships, the fact that we can leverage off their client base, their user base, their knowledge, their transactional history, their API data, the rich data that we're pulling from these partners, you know, that, that, that furthers our business and it also makes our business better. It makes the users happier, gives them better access to product, better access to capital, better access to funding you know, all within the same ecosystem. So they don't have to leave, they don't have to jump off, they don't have to pick up the phone, they don't have to jump on Google. So there are all these mechanisms and, and, and strings that we're trying to pull for the partnership. So um, without partners, and again, if you look across the whole whole spectrum, even like you touch on Afterpay now with Square, you know, the fact that they've taken that route and they said, all right, it was an acquisition, but in the true sense of the word, it's going to be, a, it's a partnership. It's an acquisition, but it's a partnership. They're going to, um, stick their tick their, their tech together and they're going to distribute and they're going to distribute their, their range of products exactly what we do just without the acquisition piece where we do deep integrations we're in workflow we're in app we have that digital um, origination we have that digital distribution through through that b2b network and that's how you're going to go to market and that's how you're going to grow it the partnership is essential essential in every fintech and that's what we're finding that's what we're seeing across the board well, certainly working for you which is great i mean in terms of the 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 road where you had take the taken or received those offers, how do you how did you sort of quantify the the position as a founder to say should I de-risk a little bit and take some money off the table, uh, or should I put it all on black or half of my chips on black? How do you think about when it's your money? Because yeah. this is what a lot of the founders are going to go through. This is this is really. A, 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 a critical thing for them to decide how long do they keep believing and keep risking and keep attacking, et cetera. So can you share a little bit about how you approach that? Sure. We've always backed ourselves for, from day one. And I think it's very hard that if you're a founder now and you don't have that revenue from day one and you don't have that client base or you don't have that customer base that's already lined up, it's going to be hard. It's going to struggle because suddenly, again, you see those numbers going down. You see that, you know, the cash balance going down, your burn rate going up at the same time, and it's starting to hurt. And once it starts to hurt, you get in that downward spiral and you think, oh, what am I doing? Am I doing the right? Maybe I should go back and get a nine to five. At least I know I'll get a paycheck at the end of the week. I don't have to work Saturday nights. I don't have to work Sundays. You know, I don't have to stay till four in the morning trying to, you know, talk to, you know, overseas, et cetera. So um, it, was, it was slightly different for us. You know, we, we started small. We started, you know, with the, the turnover sort of six, seven, million back in the day um, we constantly we, we grew it steadily i mean this is a not an overnight success you know it's a, we say it's a you know it's a five-year overnight success sort of thing so it's a 
it's a journey. It's a journey definitely that we've been on over the last five years and the numbers can substantiate that. But if we didn't have those numbers and that build up over that time, you know, it would have been a struggle. But again, if you have the clients that they want, if you build a client in base and you start to have revenue, and not to say, well, if I go to market now, how am I going to get, you know, oh, maybe I'll find one client and maybe I'll do a, a pay per model, maybe I'll do a subscription model, maybe I'll do a hybrid, you know, I will work it out as we go along. You don't have that much time because you're burning. You need your products, you need your tech, you need your infrastructure, you need your staff, et cetera. So, um, again, we, we're a big believer in, you know, if you can sort of ride out that wave and you, and you have that vision and you back yourself, then it's, then it's definitely worth it. Yeah, it's a matter of getting the, de-risking as many of the, the, the proof points, if you like, from your market, your model, you know, your channels, um, you know, and, and even you know, the market you're in. So I think you've done a, a great job of doing that, which is um, credit to you and your team. You. Um, so I think we're sort of right on time. Um, so maybe last question is really um, the one thing that keeps you up at night. Um, the one thing that keeps me up at night. Uh, I was going to say the kids, but they're already older. So... <laughs> So, you know, they're, they're a lot older now. Um, I think, look, the main thing is growth. You know, everyone's, everyone wants growth. You're in the fintech. Like you said, there's a lot of fintechs coming. They're up and comers. Um, you know, we have a long pipeline. We have a great team now. Um, but it's, it's continuing that growth. And, you know, you're only as good in, in the finance industry. You're only as good as your last lend. So as long as we keep lending, we're good. And uh, so far, the numbers are strong. You know, the quarterlies, again, we've said the quarterlies came out today. The numbers are good. You know, we're up and, you know, please God, we continue to, to push that forward. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll try next year again to uh, see the next, next lot of founders. Well, Raul, thank you very much for your time. Really enjoyed having a chat and uh, keep up the great work. And um, thank you. Leo and the team, thank you very much for a brilliant and the, the, uh, the founders. Great presentations. Not easy. Yeah. So. Congratulations and um, keep up the great work. Hopefully that was um, uh, on time for everyone. I hate, hate running over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dave and Rael, uh, for this great, great discussion. We got uh, a lot out of it. And, you know, I agree. And good luck for, you know, to keep on the, the growth, uh, you know, and sleep, sleep uh, like a baby, uh, <laughs> baby at night. Uh, we'll definitely be, uh, be in touch and, you know, looking forward to welcoming you uh, in person, uh, you know, very shortly at our uh, office or next event, um, you know, in partnership with uh, with Old Shadwick in particular. Um, so for everyone, thanks, thanks so much, uh, you know, for attending today. Uh, you know, we'd love you to complete the the very short survey and give us some insights, including, you know, what's your key takeaway from this event when you um, leave the Zoom. Uh, very important and, you know, key KPI for, uh, for my team as well. Uh, you don't need to be, you know, super kind, but like, you know, if you, if you like the event, like the, the format um, and or anything specific uh, you want to see at the next event, please, uh, your feedback is very, very valuable for us. Um, in terms of next event, uh, we plan our Christmas edition on the 9th of December in Sydney and online. Uh, so watch this space. Um, if you want to pitch or if you are an investor, want to give a bit of your view around you know, what has been happening on the uh, fundraising uh, and investment scene uh, in 2021 and you know, what's your thought on 2022 and what the uh, future uh, lies uh, next year, uh, that's the, the right event for you to be uh, joining. Uh, as well as you know, if you haven't already joined your community, you know, Come and join our community of just over 750 uh, entrepreneurs, mentors, uh, investors, and technology partners. Um, so big, big thanks, you know, uh, as well to you know Axel and my my whole team, uh, you know Francia, Divenci, Puja. Uh, you know we've been working very hard, you know, over the last month since our last, uh, you know, uh, event series, which was already kind of covering fintech from a global. Sp um, standpoint uh you know a real pleasure to be working with this uh, with this team uh you know with axel you know and with the like of you know david yan ling uh you know uh, evan for uh, salesforce app exchange 
uh, you know, a number of really uh, key partner. Um, so that's it, you know, three minutes uh, just after the, um, after 5.30 here in Sydney. Uh, really looking forward to, you know, seeing you in person very, very soon. Stay safe, take care, you know, and good luck for, uh, you know, and hard work always pays, okay? So hopefully you, you will apply some of the takeaways and insights from, you know, all the session today. Uh, you know, all the advice from, uh, from Rob, you know, uh, around, you know, talking about the traction of Excel, you know, talking about really the, the problem you, you're looking to solve. Um, uh, a big well done and congratulations to uh, Tim uh, and Greg from uh, Pencil Pay also for winning uh, the main award uh, today. Uh, and, uh, and also the Public Choice Award. Uh, so looking forward to have uh, Tim and Greg on our, on our podcast. Uh, and well done to uh, Shivani from uh, The Remarkable Woman. It would be a pleasure to you know, be working closely with you uh, in the next uh, days or weeks. Enjoy your evening, everyone, or afternoon or morning if you were joining from uh, from Europe, and we'll see you soon. Stay stay tuned. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks, Leo. You're welcome. Take care.